Testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. Can you test me? Can you hear me? Yes, we are live and ready to get this thing going. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you feel me? Can you smell me? Are you ready? Are you ready for this edition of Illinois Minati? I'm going to need to get me a stand for the monitor. What's up, y'all? All right, you ready? Let us get ready. Hold on. Y'all ready? All right, let's get ready to rock and roll. What's up, Chicago? This is your man, Mays Jackson, getting ready for the next episode of Illinois Minati. Are you ready for episode four? Season two, episode four. Get ready, get ready, get ready. But before we get started, let me do this. Let me get you all a little intro. All right, you ready? Let's go. What's up, Chicago? This is your man. This is your man, Maze Jackson, getting ready for our second. This is season two. That's right, our second season of Illinois Minati. Uh, this is episode four. Episode four. Boy, where is the time going? Where is the time going, y'all? You know what? So uh, I decided, uh, let me back up. Let's do some of the basic housekeeping. What's up? Welcome back. Season two, episode four of Illinois Minati, Inside Illinois' Political Secret Society. My name is Maze Jackson. I'm the host of the WVON Morning Show. You can catch me every day, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9, with my co-host, Sonia Escobar, who is in the building right now with us. Ah, just, just joking, Todd. Just joking. Well, kind of. I'm just serious. Uh, Sonia Escobar is in the building. Shout out to uh, the rest of the Morning Show team, Jennifer Thompson, as well as my co-host, Todd Stroger. Todd Stroger. But this is not the WVON Morning Show. This is where we get loose. You know, on the WVON Morning Show, we often talk about a lot of the different things that we have going on. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes I'm not able to get all the way down deep into the dirt and into the weeds that I'd like to because I only got so much time. And I'm sure people get tired of hearing uh, the... I'm sure people get tired of oftentimes hearing the... Um, hearing, hearing politics all day. But this is for the political junkies, right? So if you are a political junkie, you want to tune in to the Illinois Minati podcast because we get it in and we tell you the dirt behind the stories. We tell you the dirt behind the stories. Um, are we all set? We good? We got everything we need? All right, huh? Okay, so Carol has always got Carol, you always got a problem. I'm going to tell you what. So can I say something? Because, you know, y'all, we be watching these notes and everything, and we love you all to death. But can you please, before you say you can't hear and you can't do all that, can you go through and check all your buttons and check all your stuff? Because you change up. I get all these people looking at me in my face. They running around. Make sure you check, all right? Can you do me a favor, too? I did ask you real quick. Can you like the Maze Jackson page on Facebook? Can you follow Maze Jackson on Twitter or like at Maze Jackson said on 
uh, Instagram. All right, and in case you didn't know, I am Maze Jackson. <laughs> How about that? All right, so uh, also speaking of Springfield, I want to send a shout-out to everybody who went to Springfield with us yesterday in support of House Bill 4865. Shout-out to State Representative Cam Cambium Buckner. Buckner. Cambium Buckner and everybody who welcomed us down to Springfield yesterday. I must tell you all, it I felt like a triumphant return to uh, the place that I learned so much about what I am teaching you or sharing with you. Now, you know, uh, down in Springfield, all this stuff stays secret, right? And so people get kind of upset when I start telling them all the good stuff. But it was funny because I went down there yesterday and there was a lot of people who were hating. And now it seems like they're, they're not so hateful. That's all good. It's all love. You can't trip. Um, uh, while we're at it, let's do some housekeeping. I told you one more time. The Maze Jackson page. What's in it for the black people page? Like both of those on Facebook. Follow me at Maze Jack on Twitter. I got to get my Twitter game up. And I got to get my Instagram game up. Because, you know, I have some great pictures. I was just flipping. When I was getting ready for the show today, I got some great pictures. But I'll tell you, I didn't use them. I never post them because I get kind of tired of them. Not tired of them, but I'm 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 really starting to feel like I'm, I'm I might have peaked on social media, you know. Like if you notice, I don't post a lot of stuff anymore. Like I don't post a lot of Maze Jackson fishing. Maze, well, I don't fish that much, but you know. Uh, but we'll talk about it all. I'm 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 really changing up the way I'm looking at uh, social media because I am. Man, it, it becomes exhausting sometimes. It becomes exhausting. And it seems like every time I put out there, somebody out there looking. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that are watching, um, it's no need to hate on me. Just step your game up, right? Just step your game up. Invest yourself, right? Invest in yourself. Believe in yourself. You know what I'm saying? See, you too can get robotic cameras. See that? That's me controlling my own podcast. So see that? See that? You can do that too. You can buy that. It's at the store. You can get you one. But you ain't got to hate on me, right? You ain't got to hate on me. But... It's okay, because I've, I've decided that the more you hate, the more I love. Right? The more I love. All right, guys. Get ready. It is Illinois Minati, episode two. Or episode four, season two. Uh-oh. You ready? Am I in focus? Can you all see me? Is everybody good? How about this? Let me do this. Let me say what's up to everybody who is rocking with us right now uh, before we go. Shout out to Regina Gibson. Shout out to uh, Carol Zwizek. Shout out to Diane Moon. Shout out to Stanton Helms. Shout out to Mario C. Jones. What up, Mario? Uh, shout out to Tiger Lily. Shout out to Regina Gibson, Alvin E. Norton. Always rocking with us. Uh, shout out to... Who else is out there? Marvin Hill. What's up, Miss Moore as well? All right. Let's get it cracking. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right, let's ready. Boy, it's getting hot in here. You know, it feels good. You know, we got like a little professional studio. So we got us a little, see, we got lights, camera, action. All hell to one. Huh? Unplug the lapel? All right, no problem. How's that? Is that better? Can you hear? Everybody good? All righty. So let's get this thing started. When we left off last week, I had given you, really, over the last four weeks, we've been breaking down what's been going on in the western suburbs. What has been really going on in the western suburbs? What is that? Yeah, I can focus too. Wait, wait, are we going too far back? You want to go there? Hmm? All right, there you go. Everybody see me? Can you see me? All right, so when we left off last week, I've been giving you, for the last four weeks, I've been breaking, three weeks, I've been breaking down kind of the Illinois Minati as it worked in the western suburbs um, and how kind of, I think what I did was we got through that whole process, and I think over three weeks, I introduced you to the lobbyists, the lawyers, uh, and then eventually we connected you to the mole and the lawyer who brought the mole, the lawyer who brought the mole to the western suburbs. Now, guys, the reason I'm going to do this is because there's a couple of connections, and I'm trying to figure it out. But the more I do this, I'm starting to think that there were more people 
who have been cooperating with the feds, right? There have been more people who have been introduced to the feds. And the more I think about this story, I'm really starting to think that there's a lot more that we need to take a look at. So what I wanted to do today was take the helicopter up. So we've been in the western suburbs, right? You know where that is. So, you know, we've been over there. Let's go and let's move it to the south side of Chicago, where we are going to stop and take a trip to the village of Pilsen. And we are going to break down what happened with 25th Ward Alderman Danny Solis and the damage that Danny could do to the whole Illinois Minotti. Now, I'm going to start out by um, letting you know that um, Danny Solis, again, friend, or someone that I considered, let me let me not say it's not someone I would go to his house and hang out with. But, like, if I saw him in the place, I'd be like, hello, what's up? We'd hang out. You know, we'd talk. We'd shoot the, shoot the breeze. Danny Solis, I always thought of Danny Solis as a kind of a very upstanding and upward bound guy. Um, now, I just want to be clear. Can I, can I make sure that we all are clear? Because, you know, last week after last week's podcast, people were talking about they wanted to sue me. People were talking about they wanted to send a squad against me, all type of stuff, because I'm telling y'all. Yeah, see, what y'all don't understand is that the information that I am giving you is information that really nobody knows. Yesterday I was in Springfield. And it just reminded me of all of it. As I walk through the Capitol, as you look at the stained glass, as you look at the buildings, you realize that within the walls of the Capitol of the state of Illinois is where the Illinois Minati was born, bred, grew, and has gotten to its most powerful state. But I also want to let you know I am an entertainer, right? And so I want to give you a little bit of entertainment to go with it. So I try to do this in a storytelling fashion. Um... And while I am telling these things, I am not suggesting that they are fact. I am suggesting that these are alleged. I am alleging that this is how, if I was still there, how I would interpret what we're seeing. Now, what is the difference between what I do and what you get in the newspaper? Um, the difference between what I do and what you get in the newspaper is, I always say that the people in the newspaper have always taken the stories that the, that the people in politics give them. I lived the politics. And so the stories that I'm telling you are based on my true life experience. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. So y'all ready? So what my goal is to take all of the stories that you see in the news and the press and everything else, bring it all together, and then give you my interpretation of what it all means. So tonight, we are going to discuss the damage that Danny could do. That's right, the damage that Danny could do. Now, who is Danny, you may ask? Danny is, 20, is former 25th Ward Alderman Danny Solis. Now, I first met Danny Solis years ago, uh, probably in... 1999, 98, and I think when I met Danny Solis, he was a community organizer. He was the president of UNO. Now, let's, we'll talk about UNO a little bit later uh, in a different episode because all of this will be tied together. But I think we're going to start right here, and then we'll spend a couple of weeks breaking down kind of the Danny Solis outcome and what happened. But let me go back. So Danny Solis started out as a community organizer in the 25th Ward in the area of Pilsen. And basically, Danny Solis was part of a new type of Latino that no longer was cultural. They decided that they were going to be political, and they were going to be powerful, and they were going to control their destiny. And Danny Solis, along with some other people, formed UNO, the United Neighborhood Organization. You've heard about UNO and a lot of different stories and a lot of stuff. It won't come today. At the, the, we won't unwind UNO right now. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Danny Solis, and I'm going to put Danny Solis in the puzzle. So you guys have gotten a puzzle on the western suburbs right now, and we kind of put those pieces together. So, you know, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. 
You know how, like, you can figure out one thing? And so, like, say you know where the horse is, so you put the horse together, and then you leave that alone, and then you go fix something else. And then once you do it all, you put all these sections together, and then all the pieces come together, and they start to make sense. That's what's going to happen. So I want you to take all the stuff that I talked to you about over the last three weeks, and I want you to park it. I want you to put it in a box, and I want you, yeah, oh, yeah, right, you can go to SoundCloud, and you can check it out, right? It's already uploaded. But you want to take those first three podcasts and you want to kind of put them over to the side. And let's say we've pieced the western suburbs kind of together. We still got some pieces to plug in. But now we're going to go to the other side of the puzzle. And what we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about what was happening in Chicago as well as what was going on on the southwest side. So let me go back to my to my friend Danny Solis. Danny Solis was a community organizer, lived in Pilsen, and decided that he wanted to be in control of the destiny of the things that were happening in his community. And I'm going to tell you that they were awesome. And what they did was they started building a community organization that would push back against things that Mayor Daly would do. Um, and they were fighting for Latino rights, but not the same way as Chewy Garcia and those guys were fighting for Latino rights. So Chewy Garcia and those guys, they were traditional Latinos, i.e. they wanted to do the Mexican hat dance, and they wanted to be everything is Viva, Viva Mexico. Ah, and then there was Danny Solis who decided, in conjunction with some of his partners, that the better way was to participate in the American way, not to be trying to become more Mexican, but to try to become more closer to the U.S. citizens and to be part of the power structure in the city of Chicago. Now, I'll tell you, looking at it now, Danny Solis, in conjunction, Danny Solis was a community organizing arm there was HDO, which was the political arm, and then there was MLI, which was their young professional arm. Now, all of these things weren't necessarily all working in concert, but they all eventually came together. But let's go back to Danny Solis. Now, I want to be clear. Danny Solis has always been a gentleman and a friend as it relates to me. Uh, when he was the president of UNO, he started out as an opponent to the mayor. And what happened to Mayor Daley? But what typically happened to Mayor Daley was if you kicked his butt enough, if you fought him enough on enough issues, then his answer to that would be, join us. And if you take all of that energy and power that you have and join us, then we will give you dominance over your community as long as you stay on our team. Smart move. Danny Solis then went from being the president of UNO to becoming the 25th Ward Alderman, where he ascended by the time he had been caught wearing a wire. He had been the mayor pro tem. He was now chairing zoning, which was one of the most powerful committees in the city of Chicago. However, the zoning committee is also where it is the easiest place to get in trouble. Park that. Danny Solis is now elected alderman by, is now has been selected for appointment for the mayor. I believe he replaced Ambrosio Medrano, who had gone to jail for bribery, right? And so Danny was selected by Mayor Daly to fill the spot of the 25th Ward alderman. Now, while he was there, he began to amass power, but the mayor was also interested in investing in the Latino community. Because remember, the black community was still bitter about Harold Washington. And so the, the new plan was to build a new political operation outside of the Democratic Party and outside, outside of the Democratic Party and outside of the black community, right? And so the Latinos became the go-to group for the for Mayor Daly. 
Danny Solis being the person in government. Now, also in government, but not as a politician, was Victor Reyes. You've heard that name, right? So we're going to talk about that, too, because this is all part of this dynamic. So now Danny Solis is now an alderman, but he has, and he also, when he left to be alderman, he then promoted Juan Rangel, my very good friend, Juan Rangel, to the president of UNO, where Juan took UNO, combined with Danny Solis and his power in City Hall, to becoming one of the most prolific and powerful community-based organizations in the city of Chicago. Quite frankly, there was a time when Everything that happened in the city, Uno had a say. If they were going to do something big, Uno was going to have a say, or they basically spoke for the Latinos. And they basically pushed Chewy Garcia and those guys out because they were always fighting the mayor. Danny's plan was to work with the mayor to get what you want. So and that, that's like an eternal fight, right? Do you fight and fight and fight and fight and never have peace? Or do you join the team and then deliver for your community? It's the chicken or the egg, right? So that's Danny Solis right at that point. Now, you have to understand that Danny was an alderman for almost 20 plus years. And in that time, he rose to a very high rank and became one of the most trusted aldermen in the city of Chicago, within the city council. He, I would tell you that Danny Solis, the, so the, the, pow, the three most powerful aldermen in city council, perception-wise, was for the black people, Kerry Austin, for the white people, Ed Burke, and for the Latinos, Danny Solis. Now, I just want to point out something. Danny Solis, federal investigation, wearing a wire. Uh, Ed Burke, federal investigation, indicted on 50 charges. Carrie Austin, feds came to her office. So now you got to say they took all the three top people in the space out. Now, I'm going to talk about all of them, but today we're going to talk about Danny Solis. And why is Danny Solis so important to this situation because Danny Solis as one of the most trusted aldermen in the city of Chicago was wearing a wire for two whole years he wore a wire for two whole years as he walked through city council city hall cut every zoning deal, approved every zoning. And so he was in an ideal position for the feds. Now, you got to go back and say, how does Danny Solis, who is as important and as powerful as he is, get caught up with the feds? Well, friends, I'll tell you. It's the same thing that we see with every all of the other federal indictments. Danny Solis was living a life with a, when you run around with multiple millionaires and, and people and you're appro approving million dollar deals and you're deciding whether big buildings are going to go up, people want to court you. People want to be around you. They want to get you things. They want to make you happy. Danny Solis as the zoning chair, essentially started to reap some of those perks and those benefits. Unfortunately, some of those perks and benefits were obtained illegally. So I want to point something out, guys. I want to point out that most of, every, most of these guys getting in trouble are seeking to mimic what they've seen Madigan do, in that they have seen the speaker make hundreds of millions of dollars as a lawyer or as an outside business using his position as the speaker. Now, the difference is 
The speaker writes the rules and the laws and writes the loopholes that he can walk through. He is an expert, and I would tell you that if you were to go through the speaker stuff and there was no Mike McClain and there was no crazy emails, I'm going to tell you the guy was probably so disciplined that he probably didn't do anything wrong. But what he did was he created an environment where everybody who's not as smart as him thinks that they are as smart as him, and so they figure they can figure out ways to get money the same way the speaker. They start another company. Remember Sandoval had the translation company because he wanted to have an outside business that it wasn't illegal to have. But I, I, I want to go back to Danny Solis because Danny Solis – as we look at this, does not seem to have, he doesn't even seem to try to cover it up. Like, so everybody else had a company or a business, et cetera. But if you pay attention, how Danny Solis got caught up was his very good friend who was mentioned, or I'm going to say we're alleging that he got caught up from his good friend who he thought he could trust Roberto Caldero, who was a lobbyist, who was not only, instead of supplying Danny Solis with information and going back and forth, he was supplying him with Viagra pills, sending him to Asian spa to spas where he was getting favors, et cetera, from women, et cetera. So Danny Solis didn't seem to be trying to profit from his position. It seemed like he had gotten into some economic trouble and some drug trouble and some sex trouble, and that's what kind of caught him up. His didn't seem to be, but what you see is, and, and, and I'll talk about this. I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this probably in the next episode. What you see in the Danny Solis indictment, and I think it's important, not indictment, but the affidavit, is what you have to look at is the various sections that were in the indictment. And then the people who were caught up in that, in that document. Now, I'm going to read some of the names. Whoa. Some of the names that were involved in this, and I want to break it down. So if you looked at that indictment, then you saw that there was, you know what, let me do this. How about this? Let me take a pause. Stop. How about you, no, let me take a pause because I want to catch a drink, I want to catch a break. And then, no, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back. So let's pause right here. Let's pause the podcast. You all go get a drink. We'll be back in about two minutes. It is the Illinois Minotti Podcast. We'll be right back. And when we come back, I'll break down all of the people you saw in the Solis affidavit and how it could all be tied together because when you look at this it seems like they could take the entire latino crew down the latino wing of the illinois minati hey y'all when we come back we'll talk about it give me just a hot minute and we'll be right Yeah, I'm about to play the intro real quick. No, nope, not yet. All right. And we are.
What's up, Chicago? This is your man, Maze Jackson, and we are back. That's right, you are tuned in to Season 2, Episode 4 of Illinois Minati. Now, when we left off, I went to commercial break. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, I dropped my monitor just by the way. Hey, man, we got to make this thing fun. It's like, this is a podcast. You know, this is a podcast. I'm trying to do it like it's a TV show, but it's a podcast. We chilling now. You know what I'm saying? So, no, check it out. So, when we went... When I left off and we went to break, I was telling you that the the affidavit in which we found out that Danny Solis was wearing a wire revealed a tremendous amount of information if you understand what you're looking at and what you're reading now when they start putting individual a and company b and xyz and abc it gets very 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 confusing but if you understand and you know what's going on then it's very easy to piece together what happened now can i tell you now y'all i'm gonna I'm a break this thing down real simple can i break it down for you real simple here's the people that were named in the Celise wire right you had Victor Reyes named in the in the in the in the document. Now we've heard Victor Reyes's name before uh, in the West Suburban situation. Danny Solis. Danny Solis was accused of wearing the wire. We also saw the name Proco Joe Marino. Can I also let you know that Proco Joe, one of my guys, another one of my Proco Joe, when I ran for alderman, he was not an alderman. We were both young Democrats together. He wrote the first check to my campaign, Proco Joe Marino. Uh, Roberto Maldonado, he is the alderman of the 29th Ward. Rick Munoz. Rick Munoz, if you recall, was the alderman who was actually over on the west side of Chicago. He's like West Little Village area. Alderman Munoz is the one you saw. He was having issues with his wife and drinking, etc. He was in the news quite a bit. He resigned. Then you saw Alderman George Cardenas also involved in this scandal. Now, I'm going to point something out to you that people probably did not realize. Uh, Proco Joe Moreno, so uh, Alderman Cardenas, and I believe I believe Alderman Munoz and Alderman Maldonado were all had a very 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 pow had very powerful positions in the Latino caucus in the Chicago City Council, as well as Alderman Danny Solis. You want to know what they were all? Most of them were, and I can't verify. I think I can tell you that Solis, Cardenas, and Moreno were definitely all chairman of the Latino caucus. Now, I got to help you understand. So why is that important? And how does that connect all of the dots? Well, what do the lobbyists do? The lobbyists raise the money. Who's the lobbyist in this situation? Victor Reyes. Victor Reyes was who before he was a lobbyist. He was the head of intergovernmental affairs, the head of intergovernmental affairs when Danny Solis was selected to be the alderman to replace Madrano. So if I select you to be the alderman, you now owe me your political career. Let's also say, because how it happened is Mayor Daly would say to Victor, hey, we got a, we need a Latino spot. Who do you get? And he says, get this guy. Same thing happened for Cardenas. But let me not back up. Cardenas, I believe, was elected by HDO when they decided they were going to take people out. But here's the point. The point is, at, at a minimum, Solis, Moreno, and Cardenas were all chairman of the Latino caucus. Now, why is that important to the lobbyist? 
it's important to the lobbyists because it creates the perception that the entire Latino caucus is behind you. So if I am shopping for business, remember, the lobbyist is looking to make money off of his political relationships. Now, there's one way where someone has a trouble, and we've seen that. And there's other ways when they create trouble for you. Well, essentially what happened was Victor's strategy in dealing with landing new clients was to everybody knew that the Latino caucus was the favorite caucus in city council. So what Vic would do is go to every chairman of the Latino caucus and say, hey, man, my clients will raise you $100,000, right? Now, if you're the chairman of the Latino caucus, you like, what? We never had that kind of money. But essentially, in exchange for raising that money that they use for scholarships, et cetera, you then have the president of the Latino caucus that will come to your meetings. So sit, uh, so now if you have the chairman of the Latino caucus show up at your meetings when you're trying to land new clients, guess what? People are like, man, he got all the Latinos behind him. And so you instantly say, well, it would be good for me to sign up with this guy. Remember how it happened for, for remember the 800-pound gorilla being Sandoval in Springfield? And if Springfield would be your, he would be your protector? It was the same concept. So if I have the chairman of the Latino caucus and you see me bringing them to the meeting and you have an issue, right, I say, the Latino chairman is with me. If you stick with me, all the Latinos will roll with you. So, and then essentially, in exchange for, for making you the chairman of the Latino caucus, right, because when they're looking for you to become the chairman of the Latino caucus, this is city council, you got to be able to raise money. So if I tell you I can put 100 grand on the table, for you, there's really nobody else that can do it. So now, essentially, I am selecting the chairman of the Latino caucus. And in exchange for selecting the chairman of the Latino caucus, the chairman of the Latino caucus will now, as we heard him tell, as we saw in the affidavit, they Victor then expected that because he helped them, that they are they were supposed to get him business. So if you read when he so think about this. Think about when you read the document and you see that the chairman of the most powerful committee in city council is being summoned to the office of a lobbyist, and the lobbyist is waving his finger and telling the chairman of zoning. I expect that you will go get me my money. Where is my money? And then he says, he he says, Rick Munoz gave me money. Uh, uh, Roberto Maldonado, uh, Cardenas, and Proco all got me money. Danny, where is your, you haven't brought me a thing. So now, now, let me ask you a question. How is the lobbyist who makes his money from having relationships with the elected official more powerful than the elected official. So think about when a lobbyist comes and sits people in their office, and I saw it happen, where they would line up and come in, because if you control the money, you control the politicians. Now, the challenge becomes for Danny Solis is that he's got some other issues, right? He liked Viagra. He liked, but the goal of that lobbyist is to find out what your weaknesses are and supply them. Hence, the Roberto Caldero, who really set Danny up. So now, nobody's really talked about this, but as I was watching this, the way that it appears to me that Danny Solis got caught up was Roberto Maldonado not Roberto Maldonado, Roberto Caldero had an incident with the feds. And when he had his incident with the feds, the feds said, who can you get? 
and he says, I can give you the chairman of zoning. So now the chairman of zoning, now think about this. Everybody who is doing any development is going to come before the chairman of zoning. So now you see later on in the indictment that Danny Solis is now bringing people to the speaker of the house for his property tax business, right? Because remember, here's the lick. If I get the client, right, the first thing I – remember I told you what they do is they get inside the company and then they figure out how they could chop it up? So the first thing they do is they get inside the company, they figure out what the problem is. Once you've got them on the hook, the first thing Solis wants to do is take you to Madigan because if you're on Madigan's team, if Madigan is your property tax lawyer and people find out, everybody's getting out of the way. Whatever you want to have happen, happens. Now, he won't say he's the speaker. He'll say, I'm calling, hi, this is Michael J. Madigan calling you on behalf of my client, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you got the most powerful man in the sit in the state calling you on the phone saying, don't mind my other job where I could destroy your life. I just want you to help my friend. What are you going to do? Help the friend. But now here's the thing. Danny Solis was wearing a wire. So Danny Solis was wearing a wire. Now, check this out. The thing about the speaker is he doesn't talk on the phone. Like, he don't use the phone. So everybody's like, he's... Danny Solis was having one-on-one -on -one meetings while he was wearing a wire with the speaker. Now, here's the thing that I don't think... Here's the thing I don't think everybody paid attention to because it wasn't as colorful as... Ed Burke saying the cash register didn't ring. It wasn't as colorful as uh, Sandoval saying, uh, don't you got a baloney company? But what you heard from the speaker was when he was talking about the client was, we don't look to make this a short relationship. We want to make this a long-term relationship. What do I tell you? They don't want to take you out. They want to bleed you over the years. So essentially... When they were planning, when Danny Solis was talking to the speaker and talking to the client, they were basically negotiating the fee, and the speaker was basically saying, I want you to be my client forever and ever and ever and ever, and you will be rewarded by giving me this business. Now, the thing that we got we to gotta look at right now is, so right now, Danny Solis in the wire has now got Speaker Madigan on the wire. He's got Proco Joe Moreno, Alderman Roberto Maldonado, Rick Munoz, and George Cardenas all on the wire. Take it another step. He's also got Ed Burke on the wire. Right? So Ed Burke and Pete Andrews, who's Ed Burke's right-hand man, all of these people are now on the wire. Now, here's the thing. There are peripheral names mentioned in the indictment, names of people, organizations, etc., who for some reason aren't necessarily looked at as the subject of the federal investigation, which then makes me say that they're cooperating. Now, here's my premise. Here's my premise. My premise is that once having been knocked, had my door knocked on by the feds, if you lie to the feds, you're going to jail. So it's like everybody's trying to pretend like there's this honor. But what we're finding out and what we're seeing is that everybody's talking. We saw that in the western suburbs, the lawyer that everybody trusted introduced them to the federal informant. Right? And now we're seeing a wave of people getting arrested, indicted and arrested, and losing their jobs in the western suburbs. We haven't seen that, but we've seen what I have been saying is if you look at that affidavit on Solis, every section has a group of people that have in some way, shape, or form done something that could be misinterpreted or interpreted as a crime. So now, check this out. 
you got Danny Solis with the people I've named. Now, check this out. He's a, but the connecting glue, the connecting glue is the lobbyist. Victor Reyes, who put, who, who got, who put, wait a minute, but Victor Reyes made Danny Solis an alderman, made all of those guys who he talked about giving money a, uh, made them chairman of the Latino caucus. Then, at the same time, he also was best friends with Sandoval and got Sandoval plugged up. Protect, you see the same protection racket going on, and at the same time, Victor is the coldest guy. Now, check it out. You got to take it back, though. Victor might be the coldest dude out here, and he might be throwing everybody under the bus. Because, see, as I'm looking at it, it seems like everybody that's getting in trouble has a line directly to him, right? And, and my question becomes, is he recruiting more people to be federal inv informants? Now, you might say no, but we just saw that last week Omar Manny was introduced to all of these people by his best friend. Victor and Sandoval were best friends. But when the feds come get you, how many friends you got? Y'all, I'm telling y'all now. I'm telling you all now, it's about to get crazy. Now, here's the other part. So, and and this, we still got to break down the solution. Like, I haven't broken down the document. This is just so you can get a sense of the people that are playing. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you take, a, if you were to take a line and draw a line. So right now, we see that there is a relationship between Reyes and the, and the Sandoval situation, Reyes and the Solis situation. And when we extrapolate this out in three weeks, you'll see that there's a connection to Reyes and the Madigan McLean situation. So the question becomes, how are all of these people getting in trouble and you're not? Then, if you go all the way back to where we first met Mr. Reyes, then you would realize that we found out about the HDO scandal. The, remember the hire truck scandal? The trucks where the Latin King was selling, was selling the contracts and it was an HDO operation. People went to jail. The, the bosses went to jail except for who? Victor Reyes. So now the question has to be, for everybody involved as they're trying to find the snitches, because once, once you get busted, then you're in the web. How come all of these people are, are now in trouble and we have and and i'm going to tell you when they say lobbyists a and b in a lot of the documents a lot of people are alleging that lobbyists a and b are victor and his partner mike noonan now this is all alleged this is all alleged and, and the reason i know a lot of this stuff is because i work there right and so i used to see stuff you know how you see stuff and you don't realize what's going on until you read the story and then you say wait a minute y'all and in all of this, hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars are moving around. And yet and still, black folks got none. Now check it out. And then when you think about Carrie Austin, hers was about trying to keep a house. These guys were about enriching themselves and their families. Hey, y'all, this is fourth episode of Illinois Minati. I'm going to do this because I'm going to end it just a little bit early because I'm going to give you all the opportunity to ask some questions. If you got any questions, if I want to send some shout outs. So guys, why don't you all look at the broadcast and if anybody's got any good questions, let me know and I'll answer them before we go. How y'all feeling today? Did, was it informational? Was it informative? Did you appreciate it? Was it boring? Hmm, y'all didn't even like the broadcast. This, this, I mean, am I making sense? or am I, I mean, does this stuff make sense to you all? What's up, Greg? No. Um, Kennedy, the Kennedys own Wolf Point. 
Um, Sterling Bay is the largest developer right now, and they're doing the most development. It's Sterling Bay. It's related Midwest. I actually represent um, one of the largest developers out of Canada that's operating here. Um, huh? Uh, huh? Yeah. Um, no, it is not owned by the Kennedys that I am aware of. What else? Anybody else got a question? Wow, he was tripping. Hey, I never guessed him. Oh, I sure did answer that in October. Um, oh, one last thing. Little Birdie told me one last thing. Little Birdie told me um that next week. Matter of fact, next week we're gonna look at some of the other people that could potentially go down with Danny Solis. One of the things I forgot to mention in Danny Solis' situation was, did I tell you all that there was a point in which Danny Solis and his sister, uh, Patty Doyle Solis, uh, had started a company? Yeah, they started a company called Vendor Assist Program, right? And the Vendor Assist Program uh, basically made money off of state vendors who were not getting paid. Um, Danny Solis, remember I told y'all everybody wants to make these companies in which they use them to get paid personally? Well, guess what, guys? Guess who was the biggest, one of the biggest recipients of campaign cash from this company that Danny Solis and his sister created to make money off of people who were getting paid late by the state? Uh, Susanna Mendoza. Susanna Mendoza was accused for taking over $100,000 from this company. Now, here's the crazy part. The crazy part was Susanna was the person responsible for paying people's checks. So check this out. If I'm making $100,000 a year or getting $100,000 in campaign donations from a company who makes money off of the people that I have to pay, then I could slow down their check you then go, they need their money. You go sign up with the company. And then once you sign up with the company, the vendor assist program that Danny Solis and his sister owned, then she could release your check. But she would make you, there's it. I am suggesting that the racket was you slow down the payments of the vendors so that they need a loan that your friends provide the loan. We'll talk about that next week because, you know, I, I really have a problem with these holier-than-thou moments that people have when, again, he, they use the pain and suffering of black people to make profit. And so here is the, the comptroller of the state of Illinois who is handling our payments, handling payments, and she's directing you to go get a payday loan and she could just cut you your check. But her friends would make the money off the interest on the loan. And think about a state, when the state owes you $2 million or $3 million, and you make the interest off of that. Y'all, it's such a crazy racket. And so I guess my question is, see, my thing is, all of this is in the universe. And if I can see it, then clearly the feds can see it. Right? But they'll have you looking at everybody else. Remember she did the big old press conference about the red light cameras and the red light cameras, but she was going to protect the ones in the city? Well, think about this. They ha It's theater. These people do these things for theater to get you all emotional and upset, and on the side, they taking care of their people. So just think about that. Just think about if you were a state supplier and you are trying to make your payroll and you can't make it because the state is holding your check, and they say, hey, why don't you call my friend over there? And my friends say, I'll do it for you, but I'm going to do it for an interest. I'm going to put some interest on it, but you got to pay your bills. But the comptroller told you you should talk to this company. So you talk to the company, and then they make their money and then cut you. Y'all, so many rackets. Y'all want me to keep telling y'all about the rackets? Y'all don't want to know about the rackets. No, y'all don't. Hey, y'all, this has been Illinois Minati Episode 4. Uh, the damage that Danny could do. 
let me tell you what. I think that if you look at what Danny Solis could take out almost he could take well the Latino caucus has changed, but he could literally take down the Latino faction of the Illinois Minati. We're going to break down the rest of these people and some of the other characters, and I'll connect the dots in the next episode. Hey, y'all, uh, I got to get out of here because it is time. So you seem like you got one question. You got a question? All right. What? We did. We said who the mole was. It was. No, we did it. We did it, man. You got to pay attention, and you got to get in the podcast. All right, y'all. This is your man, Maze Jackson, uh, tuning out, signing out for this episode four. Episode four of Illinois Minati inside Illinois P- secret political society. Hey y'all, I'll be back next week. But before we get out of here, let me let y'all get the intro and outro one more time. Until next week, peace.